Jayon tried to look calm and well-rested as he left his cabin and stood by the deck railing. His eyes ached and his bones felt heavy. He hadn't slept a wink all night. Desperately wishing he had something stronger than chilled water in his copper mug, he stared out at the harsh dawn. The sounds of the occupation were new, but expected. The crying, the angry shouting, the sound of metal weapons clashing. The whale was only connected to the dock by a single bowline, so they drifted a ways out into the channel. Other boats, tied off tightly and without crew aboard, were all in worse shape, all tilted over drunkenly, tied to a now-submerged dock. The locks were finally closed, but now it seemed to have trapped in entire fathoms too much water. Through the spyglass, he could see countless homes and businesses flooded in the lowest level of the city. He hadn't ever heard of the gates failing in the past. I guess this wasn't a failure or an accident, though. Anyone other than the Inquisition would have found a unified city, one a hundred times harder to take. But it wasn't anyone else. Did this change anything? I still need to round up heretics to get their gold, to get the ore, to get the mage's money. It sounded far too complicated that way. Simplify. Get to shore. That's a non-trivial task on its own. The normally clear waters were still cloudy, with the kicked-up silt, and the dock was nearly as deep underwater as he was tall. Lower the boat and prepare to row me ashore. I've work to do, and I hope the people that can operate gates are still alive, or we're in for a lot more problems. Jeon wrapped his flailing sense of helplessness in detached cynicism. Aye! The sailors hopped to, running out the arm and winching down their small rowboat. The captain got his jacket, sabre and hat. Not that a sword would help him against inquisitors or legionnaires. Inquisition ships were docked all over the harbour, but the big ones were all at the legion docks or at anchor in the channels, none in their area, a rare spark of good fortune. He climbed down the ladder and into the whale's boat, entirely focused on his plan. Get to Tipsy Trina's, meet the guy. That was the foundation of everything else. No point in worrying about how to get out yet. For all I know, they'll be back to a regular lock schedule by lunch. The oars sliced the calm waters, no other sign of activity on their entire journey. Cap, reckon we should loot some of these capsized hulks. They ain't doing anything for anyone no more. His sailor pointed to the many ships that had been tilted by their mooring lines in the rising tide far enough to take on water and sank overnight. Might as well, actually. No. Gaon shook his head as he thought for a second. Shit, no. Do not do anything that looks like looting. There's packs of people looking for excuses to execute honest folk improving their lot. Nah, stay on the ship, keep out of sight, and keep the stove off. No point in alerting anyone you exist. I guess cut some of these docking lines on your way back, especially the ones listing but not yet taken on any water. Give them a fighting chance to float. With a graceful hop, he stepped onto the wet street, sloping up to drier land. I've got my signal mirror. Keep someone on watch for when I need a row back. Stay safe. I a cap. Fortune favor ya. Gion set off back to the pub, opting for the scenic route through the bowels of the city. The harbour road would have been quicker if he fancied a waist-deep wade through whatever delights the flood had mixed with seawater. Best avoided. Instead, he threaded through a maze of narrow alleys and unfamiliar streets. His ears were pricked for any sound out of the ordinary, well, ordinary for a city in the throes of chaos. The constant din of despair, grief and rage had become background noise to him. He was more concerned with the clash of weapons or the telltale shuffle of armed groups. Not that he was too worried about them. They were likely busy carving up their own slices of the chaos pie. Still, better to avoid becoming an unexpected dessert. 
As he navigated the urban labyrinth, Geon couldn't help but appreciate how bad he was at staying out of trouble on possibly the most dangerous day of his life. Nothing like actively seeking out a mysterious and likely criminal refugee in a city tearing itself apart. The dismantled bridges and barricaded streets from yesterday were a nightmare today. They created choke points he'd rather avoid and limited his movements at a time he'd rather be on his way. He finally made it to a familiar street, clear for a fair while in the direction he wanted to go. With a satisfied snort, he started briskly along, keeping to the side and looking down each side street before crossing. He was just starting to feel safe when he heard, You, halt, you with the hat. Fuck. There really wasn't a best case here. Maybe it was an abnormally deep-voiced lost child that needed someone to hold his coins while he napped. Jeon turned slowly, hands raised and empty. His heart lurched as he faced a line of armoured inquisitors. Two aimed crossbows at his chest, while another pair hefted halberds. At their centre stood the apparent leader, weaponless save for a sheathed sword at his hip. Their ornate plate armour gleamed dully in the early morning light, each piece adorned with sigils, ribbons, and wax-sealed prayers. The leader's armour was a notch above the rest, complemented by a deep red cape that seemed to drink in the shadows. In the awkward grammar of zealots that spend too much time reading scripture, the leader said, Shade-born wretch, upon which paths doth thy feet alight. A fine day to you, Fatter, Jeon said slowly. I should have spent at least some time reading about their crazy triangle gods. Did they even have a god? Not like my life would ever depend on knowing that. Dost thou mock with flippancy? Has the light of day struck blindness upon you? His face was twisted in disgust rather than anger, but that still didn't make Gion feel comfortable. No disrespect, Your Holiness. I'm a simple sailor, and I've not much traffic with folk as exalted and holy as yourself. Gion took off his hat and bowed deeply. Oh, I hope he just wanted to make sure I'm not an unwed trollop and maybe bless me. The sea captain got a better look at the breviary slips and golden vellums attached with tiny wax seals on the polished steel armour. There must be a hundred blessings affixed. You'd think a man of faith would only need one. Maybe I should tell him that he prays wrong. Then mayhaps the light shines through your ignorance. Tell me, hast thou been to luminal services in this city even once? The Inquisitor eyed the captain like a farmer might look at a hog parasite. Gion smiled slowly as his mind raced. If I say no, he's gonna kill me. If I say yes, he's gonna ask a fucking follow-up question, and I couldn't even tell him where the fucking cathedral here is, let alone a name or a place or a service or a ritual. Then he'll have me lying about his triangle god, and then I'm a real heretic, and he'll kill me slow. The Inquisition must have rules for foreigners. Jagged Cove is thick with heathens. And that's where they're based. No fatter, I'm not from here. I trade up and down the coast and haven't had the privilege of hearing the uh, light here. Obviously no one hears light. I'm busted. Damn it. Then the light has granted me a suitable tool for my duty. I shall test your worth. Shit. Do you keep the truths of the light in your heart, this day and for all days? Aye. We both obviously know what those are, so no need to be asking details. Do you stand against the poisonous heresy that corrupts this world into filth? Aye. Who in hell would admit that if they did? Dost thy faith burn brightly enough to purify darkness? Aye. Too easy. He'll do. We only need a few more for a quorum, and the sun is scarcely risen. Hurash, guide our brother in light to the sacred amphitheatre. His soul is pure. One of the inquisitors with a halberd motioned him to follow. He wasn't bound, and the weapon wasn't pointed at him, but running away seemed ill-advised. He desperately scanned for better options, and found none. 
My soul both exists and is pure. That's got to be a good thing. A much darker flood of possibilities swept over him. Trusting the Inquisition always works out for heathens. He was marched uphill towards the fancier parts of town. They passed checkpoints where more plate-armoured inquisitors or maybe brothers militant stood at attention. The captain racked his mind for any memory of how they were organised or what ranks meant to them, but he came up empty. There were at least three types of tabard, and the armour varied a lot, but that was too little too late to change whatever fate lay ahead. It was clear that most of the people they met deferred to his escort, but there were a few that he deferred to, including some older men dressed more like lords than soldiers. Their greetings and respects were in their ecclesiastical language. He might as well have been taken captive by some other kingdom. He had nothing to say to the man leading him. Harash, maybe. But that was fine. At least he wasn't being asked anything about his apparently perfect soul, either. Gian subtly pulled his new copper triangulum pendant out from under his coat and centred it prominently over his chest. Finally, they arrived at a wide open market green. It wasn't the city's cultural amphitheatre at all, but one they were constructing in this wide, flat space. Countless labourers were sawing and hammering at what looked to be tiered stands. Many more were sitting on the grass, polishing sheets of copper. His escort stopped and asked, Have the seas blessed you with the art of carpentry? Now the sea can bless things. Finally, we agree. No fatter. I've never been a ship's carpenter. It's fine. The truly devout Polish the copper go on then. The armoured man pointed to the group on the grass. Geon glanced around. There were nearly a hundred inquisitors standing about, some more alert than others. The green was wide, and despite the few hundred people present, it didn't feel especially crowded. He couldn't see any way to leave without attracting attention. If being press-ganged into polishing some copper sheets was the worst they had in store for him, then so be it. He just hoped this was a one-day arrangement. It was better to bide his time than attract too much attention and crossbow bolts. He ambled over to the group with the sheets. He saw a sturdy middle-aged woman had a whole stack behind her. He imagined her likely a washerwoman or a cook in normal times. Hi, love. I'm here to help get those copper sheets nice and clean, he said with a flirty smile. By light we purify. Let the copper be as bright as our souls. We can save this city. Her eyes were wide with intensity and seemed to be talking past Gion. He smiled uncomfortably and took a thin square of copper, a raggy cloth and a small jar of abrasive mud. The sheet was pounded thin, housed in a light wooden frame. The square was pretty big. Each side was about as long as his arm and clearly quite old. The copper was dull and corroded. Taking a cue from everyone else, he sat on the grass, took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves and started rubbing it in small circles. He glanced at the people around him. They seemed to be all ages, men and women both. None looked especially wealthy, but in general most people weren't. He desperately wanted to ask these people some questions about this strange event, but they quietly murmured hymns to themselves while polishing with feverish intensity. His sheet didn't take overly long to polish, since he didn't seem to get the same joy out of the act that a lot of the others did. His was done first, despite his late start. He paused. Keep polishing is probably the right answer, since sitting idle feels insane, but maybe we are only here until they are all done. No time to be timid. ship and shiny mum. Got another for me? He asked the woman with the copper. Truly, your zeal to purify is something to behold. She inspected his first sheet closely, while reciting yet another prayer, also in the language he didn't understand. This shines with brightness. Can you purify a second? I watched you do it in solemn silence. How I envy your strength. Well, that's ominous as hell. I'm a natural, I reckon. With a friendly smile, he took the next sheet. 
Armed with some experience and a plan, he had it polished to a mirror's sheen fairly quickly. His shoulder was starting to get a bit sore, but all said, sitting on the grass with a simple task, was relaxing for him. Two women stopped polishing and started crying. An armoured inquisitor came for them and marched them to another part of the grounds. The sounds of the carpenter's work were mostly stopped now, and several of them came to join the polishing group. He held his sheet up to the light and looked for any streaks or patina. This one looked perfect too. The nature of a city west of towering mountains is that the sun didn't really shine in earnest until late morning, once it was more overhead. There was still plenty of light to see by, so even working hard Gion was nice and cool. He went up to the lady, got another one, and was pretty proud of how impressed she was. Fitting in with these triangle folk wasn't that hard after all. He polished up three more plates before they brought back one of the two women, her face red with tears and her hands shaking, but she resumed her sheet. His hard work even inspired a few other people to take second or third sheets, and the stack was nearly done now. The sun finally crested the mountain, transforming the whole city from cool shade to bright sunshine in moments. The cloudless late summer sky promised a sweltering day ahead. A gentle breeze carried the scent of the ocean. The Inquisitors reacted to some unspoken command and took positions around the green, centered on the new construction behind them. He looked around to his fellow polishers and they reacted confusingly. Some seemed to be in joy and others the deepest of despair. He thought the light they worshipped was the sun, but he also wasn't sure and that seemed like a very risky assumption to voice. Regardless, they were very excited to see the sun, so he worried his lack of reaction might be suspicious, but couldn't think of a reaction that wouldn't be... a fatter, in the long, pure, white, high-collared robes he was much more familiar with, came to their group and told everyone to take a single sheet and stand to be blessed. Jayon held his carefully by the wooden frame to make sure he didn't get a single smudge on the surface. His arms were both tired now, but getting a blessing felt like the end of it, then off to find that guy and make some money. I heard thou art an outsider, yet polished more than any three of the city's faithful, the wizened ancient fatter said in a croaking voice. I your holiness for the light. We have much to learn from your strength and purity. The fatter blessed him with the light from a small prism and moved to the next man in line to do the same. Jaon glanced around. No one else was leaving. Now that that was sorted, he didn't see where to put his copper sheet. He assumed they would be used to decorate the stands in the middle, so when they started walking towards the new structure, he knew there would be some sort of ritual. These guys didn't do anything quickly. An armoured inquisitor directed the crowd. Jeon soon found himself on the second tier of the stands, between a weeping man and a woman with an unsettling grin. Despite the growing crowd, a somber silence prevailed. People streamed in from tents and buildings around the market green, many of whom Jeon hadn't noticed before. Each person carried a copper sheet or similar object held against their left hip. Seeing this, Geon quickly adjusted his own sheet to match, hoping not to draw attention. The grinning woman beside him clutched a silvered glass mirror with an ornate frame, a stark contrast to the plain copper sheets around them. Her hair was streaked with grey, her clothes were delicately embroidered, and the lack of an obvious husband at her side led him to speculate she was a widow. She was the wealthiest local he'd seen since coming to town. Maybe she had the means to buy some full-priced gowns. Nice mirror. That's pretty fancy, Gion whispered. He hoped to build enough rapport to get some context or maybe even a useful connection. Bless your eyes. It's hung on my wall for years waiting for this exact right. It works fine as a mirror too, she whispered back. I hope today never ends. It's a shame we're only allowed to participate once. Yeah, that's a shame. His mind raced for questions that wouldn't be suspicious, but would also provide information. He took a chance. 
What part are you looking forward to the most? The sounds, it's going, she started, but an inquisitor with a long red robe and steel breastplate took to the brick stage in the centre of the hastily built amphitheatre. The inquisitor's voice boomed across the crowd, laden with menace and gravitas. Praise the light for bringing you all here today. Many volunteered, yet many needed reminding of their role in the universe. By perceiving the light, so the light is made real. Today we will perceive evil and disinfect it. Do not flinch from your duty. Redeem your foul city from this putrid heresy. We will be watching every one of you. Rejoice in justice. The Inquisitor fell silent, his gaze sweeping over the stands for several long, tense heartbeats. Aegeon felt his eyes bore straight through him and into the soul, despite not thinking he had one when he woke up this morning. He swallowed dryly. Today may not be quite over. He's majestic. That's the Grand Master of the entire Inquisition fleet, and he spoke to me. His new friend with a fancy mirror whispered excitedly. Jeon watched as a long line of prisoners was brought in. Dirty and terrified, they were chained together by a great iron chain linked to heavy collars around their necks. Inquisitors armed with halberds marched alongside them. When a prisoner stumbled or moved too slowly, the Inquisitors used the butts of their halberds as clubs. Geon winced as one such blow broke a man's arm. He lost count after fifty prisoners, but still more arrived, forming a snaking chained queue beside the stands. The air filled with the sounds of weeping, and not just from the prisoners, but from many of the copper sheet holders in the stands too. The Inquisitor remained on the brick dais, positioned opposite the prisoners. A white-robed fatter presented him with a lengthy scroll. Unrolling it, the Inquisitor began to read in a formal, deliberate tone. Bear justice in silence. The first ritual of the brightest dawn shall commence. The accused, Fata Doan, ordained by the heretical Aura Fata Mikols. The charge, heresy of the highest order. Inquisitors unlocked him from the thick chain and dragged him to the stage. They looped his iron collar into the low back wall of the platform and bound his hands to two raised poles, ostensibly there for that exact purpose. He stood there in a stained robe, arms spread wide and a bit hunched by how his collar bound him to the wall. The lead inquisitor boomed, so you are judged by five hundred and ten pure souls. All at once everyone brought their mirrors in front of themselves, and countless glowing squares of reflected sunlight appeared around the stage, quickly centering on the accused man. Like hundreds of bouncing butterflies of pure light, more and more stacked on him, and his clothes quickly began to smolder. What are you doing? Aim! This is the best part! Look at him squirm as the evil is purified right out of him! Her voice was clear and joyful. Numbly, he complied. Thankfully, it was too bright for his eyes to see much beyond the steam, but true to her word, he did squirm. The screams tore through the air, raw and primal, unlike any sound Gaon had ever heard. The man's flesh blistered and charred, the stench of burning hair and skin filling the amphitheater. Every agonizing cry echoed in Gaon's mind, even after they ceased and still they focused their reflected light on the target. Cease! the Inquisitor shouted. Everyone returned their mirrors to their left hips, and soldiers hauled the charred body off the stage. The use of refractory furnace bricks for the stage made grim sense now. The chest-plated Inquisitor boomed, the next ritual of the brightest dawn shall commence. The Accused Fata Eogene, ordained by the heretical Orafata Mikals. The charge, heresy of the highest order. So you are judged, by five hundred and ten pure souls. The horrifying certainty of how the next several hours of his day would be spent became clear. He saw the inquisitors along the side, some in armor, some in robes. He knew why they were watching them now, looking for any sign of weakness or sympathy. 
He shuddered and willed his face to be hard and expressionless, even as he reeled from the insanity of the ritual. Grimly, he focused his square of light on the heretic to burn him up too. Jeon felt a cold sweat trickle down his spine. He'd heard of the ritual of the brightest dawn, but nothing could have prepared him for this, this orchestrated cruelty, masked as divine justice. His heart pounded as he forced himself to comply, each scream a dagger to his resolve. The woman beside him was clearly having the time of her life, and the older man on the other side cried until he had no more tears, but he still participated. Most of the accused were charged with heresy, but some were charged with looting. A few wearing legion sandals were accused of treason and a smattering of other crimes. The trial was the same for every charge. Could they be killed with reflected sunlight? and in that regard the prosecution was remarkably successful. Jayon hated everything about this, his arms and eyes ached, and he was trembling for reasons he didn't fully understand. Through the floating dark spots in his vision, from staring at the concentrated light, it looked like a very young man, maybe a teenager, was being marched to the stand. Hey, that's my grandson, the silvered mirror woman exclaimed. Jayon stared at her, waiting for her opinion of this style of justice to pivot. The Inquisitor read his charge, abetting heretics, a crime the captain had some sympathy for. She blinked and took a deep breath. Die, heretic! she shouted. An Inquisitor approached her and slapped her across the mouth, drawing blood. Still your tongue during the sacred ritual, the Inquisitor said sternly. Bafflingly, he turned and left. The blood on her teeth made her look actually insane now, as her cruel smile grew wider. Further up in the stands, Gaon saw someone throw down their copper sheet and bolt, crying as they fled. The captain had been contemplating that exact plan himself. The fleeing man didn't get far. Inquisitors quickly tackled him to the ground, and Gaon winced at the sound of a bone snapping on impact. They lifted the would-be escapee off his feet and roughly carried him back. Jayon reluctantly abandoned his thoughts of running. He gripped his copper sheet tighter, resigned to stay put. With horror, he saw that he wasn't carried to the stands. He was carried to the end of the line of prisoners. They even had a box of spare, thick iron collars. With the pacifist dealt with, they continued, So you are judged by five hundred and nine pure souls. The teenager was gagged, but was clearly trying to say something. Gaon was light-headed with it all. There were still so many on the chain, and the acrid stench of burning hair and flesh clawed at Gaon's throat, making his eyes water and his stomach churn. It was a smell that would linger in his nightmares. That little bastard always had a mouth on him. I'm just glad I could help clear our family's name, she whispered. He glanced over to her face, and it was a twisted mask of sadistic joy. Numb, and by muscle memory, Gion directed his little square of light on the kid, too. One square of light can't kill anyone. I'm just speeding up the process as a mercy. Zoth Kormog, depths and tide. Be my strength my unseen guide. Still more were shackled and burnt. He wondered what would happen if clouds came over them, and then desperately wished a cloud would, maybe a rainstorm. But the light was pure and uninterrupted. Finally, they executed the last one, the man who'd run away from the stands, and the endless day was over. They all walked in solemn silence to big wooden crates to give back their copper sheets. He was behind the wealthy widow in the procession. She whispered over her shoulder, Look at that pile of spoiled meat. The city is purer already. May their bones rot in a deep pit where the light will never find them. Gion nodded slowly, his eyes fixed on the massive stack of bodies beside them. Blackened and charred like overcooked meat, the corpses bore witness to the light's uneven destruction. Some hands and backs remained eerily untouched a stark reminder of their recent humanity. The combination of scorched and intact flesh managed to make the heap even more disturbing. 
The air was thick with the nauseating blend of seared flesh, vomit, and acrid smoke. Gion fought the urge to gag as the full horror of what they'd done that day sank in more fully. The sun was low. It was nearly dinner time. Despite only eating a light breakfast and no lunch, he wasn't hungry. He stood near the exit and stared at his empty, aching hands, watching as they curled into claws from holding his execution mirror for so long. There he is. That's the outsider. Jeon wearily turned to the voice behind him. It was the fatter that blessed him with a prism after he'd polished the copper sheets a thousand lifetimes ago on that morning grass. He was walking with the head of the Inquisition, the man in the shiny breastplate that read the charges all day. Jeon's shoulders were slumped. He'd hoped to escape, but he wasn't sure he deserved to. Eh? Hey there! What's your name? You don't look like you're from around here, the Inquisitor said casually, his tone warm and friendly. He was the first one to speak like a normal person. Even his eyes seemed kind and understanding. Captain Geon, your holiness. Geon didn't bother lying. It was all over, and somehow that felt okay. Nice to meet you, Captain. I'm Inquisitor Frackman. I run the Order of the Rod he said with an easy smile. I've got to say, I'm impressed by the purity of your soul, the way you helped those folks do their duty, even when they were struggling, that really warms my heart. And polishing all those dawn mirrors, wielding it all day without a hint of joy or sorrow, just pure dedication, that's the heart of a true inquisitor right there. Honestly, not many in my order could have handled today's justice as well as you did. For the light... He nodded numbly. Jeon wasn't sure what was happening. I've written you a commendation. Show it to your fatter at your regular church and let it be a relic to your faith. Also, show it to anyone in town to let them know I'm personally watching you. That's my official seal of office. His tone was friendly, like a neighbor offering to watch his dog while he went to market. Ah, uh, can I use it to take my ship out of harbor, your holiness? Frackman laughed good-naturedly. See, you hold the faith and never lose your sense of humor. Could you imagine you and your ship will be free to go as soon as we've finished judging these heretics? There should be about two hundred more days like today, assuming I can find people as stout of heart as you to hold the dawn mirrors. I guess we'll see how sunny the winters here are. Ah, uh, thank you then. Jian still had no idea what was happening. It felt like he was being played with. You'll have to excuse me. I've a city to straighten out. Stay in the light, Mr. Jian. The friendly Grandmaster Inquisitor shook his hand and left the exhausted sea captain standing by himself, holding the vellum with a bright red wax seal. He blinked, hoping to chase away the dark floating spots in his vision. One square of light can't kill anyone. I was just speeding up the process as a mercy. No one stopped or even questioned Gion as he left and went down through the city. He passed Inquisition checkpoints, but didn't even have to show them the vellum. They just nodded as he shambled past. I hope I didn't kill all my passengers today. Maybe they're still at Tipsy Trina's. I hope they'll sell me a beer or ten, even if I did.